some of the problems. So please. Uh, can we use my machine? Ah, oh. Okay, cool. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm David, and I'll be talking to you about some of our new results on order revealing encryption. This is joint work with Kevin Lewy. So one of the emerging trends that we have seen in the last couple of years is databases get compromised. Just a couple of weeks ago, we heard that Yahoo's database was compromised two years ago by some sophisticated nation state. And information such as names, email addresses, and so on were revealed in the clear. This was not limited to Yahoo. In fact, Anthem, as an insurance company, reported a database breach. As Dan mentioned in his talk, the US voter registration database was also breached. Infamously, Ashley Madison. And the list goes on and on. You know, eBay, LinkedIn, your favorite tech company, probably at some point in time, they have experienced a database breach. And the question is, OK, we've seen this happen over and over again. And data breaches have really be sort of become the norm rather than the exception. And each time, customer information ends up being publicized on the internet. Why is this the case? Can we do something about it? So it's sort of the trend in this session has been, why don't we encrypt our data? And the answer, I think, uh, in an interview by a Yahoo senior vice president, when he was asked this question about why did Yahoo not encrypt their customer information to prevent it from going onto the internet, well, his response was it would have hurt Yahoo's ability to index and search messages to provide new user services. So there's always this tension between the need to encrypt and protect data and the need to be able to do something useful with it, namely search or query over it. So this is sort of the regime that we're working in. Can we do something useful while uh, sort of supporting the same kinds of functionalities while uh, providing some protection for the data in the event that something goes wrong and the database gets compromised? So an order revealing encryption scheme is one way of addressing this uh, problem of balancing functionality and security. So just to review, an order revealing encryption scheme, as introduced by Bonet, uh, Rakova, Louis, Sahai, Zandri, and Zimmerman in Eurocrypto 2015, is a secret key encryption scheme where a client who possesses a secret key is able to encrypt uh, numbers or other numeric values, offload them to the server, and the server can then later on, using only the ciphertext, answer order relations or answer comparison queries. In particular, it can decide whether the value encrypted by a ciphertext uh, CT1 is greater than or less than the value encrypted by a ciphertext CT2. So as you've heard uh, from the previous talks in this session, this enables legacy-friendly range queries on encrypted data. And this is why order preserving and order revealing encryption has been very popular and deployed in many instances today. So just to make sure that, uh, this is clear, in an order revealing encryption scheme, given any two ciphertext encrypted two values, let's say x and y, there's a public function that performs the comparisons. Let me just briefly contrast this with order preserving encryption, which you have also heard about in the previous talk. In an order preserving encryption introduced by Bodreva et al., uh, they impose a structural constraint on the ciphertext space, requiring it to be numeric, and the ordering relation is actually preserved directly on the ciphertext space. So in order revealing encryption is simply more general, the comparison function can be an arbitrary function, just publicly computable. So let me uh, sort of give you the landscape of order revealing encryption. So this is a very familiar plot to those, uh, those of you who have seen the previous talks. So we always have this performance security trade-off. So the first sort of construction of order revealing encryption is this notion of order preserving encryption by Baudreva et al. And as you saw from the previous talk, they actually show that even on uniform data, uh, a single OPE ciphertext already leaks half of the bits of the plain text. So this is something that does not provide very strong security guarantees, but is very, very efficient, based only on block ciphers, uh, does not require uh, using very long cipher texts. On a clear other end of the spectrum, we have these constructions of ideal order revealing encryption. And these are basically order revealing encryption schemes that only leak the ordering information, which as we saw in the previous talk is already quite significant. But this is sort of the best we can do, or the best we can hope for, if we want to build an order revealing encryption scheme. It has to, by the functionality requirements, reveal the ordering of the plain text. So these constructions that achieve ideal leakage are usually based on multilinear maps and indistinguishability obfuscation, and so probably not going to be implemented uh, by tech companies uh, tomorrow. Uh, so earlier this year, we introduced the notion of practical order revealing encryption, which is a new trade-off on this curve that provides slightly better security, at least in a theoretical setting, compared to previous OPE-based methods, uh, but is also block cipher-based and thus enjoys very good concrete efficiency and can be implemented and deployed. Uh, 
Uh, in this work, we're going to further push along this curve, uh, trading off some more security uh, in exchange for performance. And this has been a very active area of research, and there's been some concurrent uh, work uh, by Cash et al. and Joao and Pasogu, who have based, built uh, pairing-based constructions that achieve much stronger security, but again, uh, using stronger cryptographic primitives compared to PRS, and thus are less efficient. Uh, let me just uh, note that sort of the later works, starting from our previous work uh, earlier this year, have shown us how to build or to reveal encryption schemes where we have a concrete and precise leakage profile. So we can sort of understand exactly what is leaked. And hopefully this helps inform practitioners on uh, whether this is a suitable method or not. Of course, we do require evaluation on concrete data in order to uh, make that assessment uh, more accurate. So as we heard about in the previous talk, inference attack kind of destroy order revealing encryption, right? Uh, so the previous talk showed, and this was sort of extended based on a work by Navid Kamara and Wright from CCS of last year, and also in concurrent work by Grubbs et al. And, uh, earlier this year. They basically show that if you take a database that's encrypted using order revealing encryption scheme, and you combine it with public auxiliary information, and you apply frequency statistical analysis correlation analysis, you can actually do plain text recovery attacks. And in some of these attacks are very devastating in the sense that given the, just the encrypted database, you can recover like 99% of the plain text values. And this basically shows that if we just directly apply order revealing encryption for the purposes of encrypting databases, we're almost getting no security. In fact, we might be fooling ourselves that our scheme is secure when in fact it is not. So we have to be very, very careful when using order revealing encryption in practice to secure our databases. So the question that we seek to answer in this work is, is this the end of order revealing encryption? Should we even study order revealing encryption, given the fact that these inference attacks kind of completely destroy any meaningful notion of security that we get in all practical uh, scenarios? So to sort of make progress towards answering that question, we're going to uh, look at two different security models. Uh, so let me define these for now. So first we have the online security model, where the adversary actually sits on the encrypted database. This is an active corruption attack. Adversary breaks into, the, breaks into the database server and actually sits there for a prolonged period of time, observes queries, may even be able to interact with the database, inject things into the database, and so on. These attacks tend to be much harder to mount, and they're usually detected, hopefully, uh, within a small period of time. Hopefully the adversary will not be sitting on your database server for years at a time. Sometimes that happens, but hopefully that's not so common. But something that is more common today, though, when we look at these existing database breaches, is that adversary really gets a passive snapshot of the database. Adversary breaks into the server, exfiltrates the database, and dumps it onto the web. And this is a typical scenario that we experience today, where we really have a short-term compromise of, this, of a server, not a long-term compromise. But it's sort of defining these notions doesn't really make sense right now when we're looking at inference attacks. Because as we've seen, these inference attacks are in, uh, work already in the offline setting. Given just offline access to the encrypted database, an adversary can already re basically recover all of the plain text values. So it doesn't really make sense so far to separate out these two notions. But the main purpose of this talk and this work is to answer the question of can we actually provide full security or perfect best possible security against offline inference attacks while remaining legacy friendly using order revealing encryption in a different way. So this question by itself is not particularly well defined because it's actually trivial to prevent offline inference attacks. Uh, the way that we can do it is we can just encrypt the database and at search time we have the client provide a key that decrypts the database and then the client runs the query as usual. This is not a very elegant solution because it actually provides no online security, right? Uh, because if a client, who, if an adversary breaks into your server, takes a snapshot and sees some contents of memory, in particular this key that's used to answer the queries, then we're back to square one. We have something with no security. So really what we're looking for in this work is an order revealing encryption scheme or a way of using order revealing encryption in such a way that we can provide complete robustness against inference attacks while providing limited leakage in the online setting under some concrete leakage profile. So the focus of this work, because we're focused on order revealing encryption, will be on primarily performing range queries on encrypted data. And the key primitive that we're going to use to achieve these goals is an order revealing encryption scheme where the ciphertexts have some kind of decomposable structure. What do I mean by that? Let's look at a kind of candidate ciphertext. Let's say I'm encrypting the value 101. What we I mean is that I can actually take this ciphertext, run the order revealing encryption algorithm, and look at the ciphertext, and it actually can be broken into two pieces. And one of the pieces I'll call the left ciphertext, so CTL here, and one of the pieces I will call is the right ciphertext, CTR. And moreover, that we're going to impose a new structural requirement such that given only the left ciphertext and the right component of another ciphertext, 
you can already do the comparison. So traditionally, you need uh, two complete ciphertexts in order to, do the, to perform the comparison in an order revealing encryption scheme. Here, you only need sort of well, the left half of one of them and the right half of the other one. Okay, so the comparison only requires half of each ciphertext. The reason that this actually gives us increased expressivity and new power is because we can impose additional requirements or properties on these different halves of the ciphertexts. And in particular, what we're going to require is that the right ciphertexts by themselves are semantically secure, act, reveal no information about the underlying messages. And this, in particular, allows us to build an order revealing encryption scheme that can be used to build a range query data, encrypted database uh, uh, protocol that provides robustness against offline inference attacks. So let me briefly illustrate how that can be done. Suppose we want to have, we have a database, and we want to support encrypted range queries over this database. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each column over which we want to support range queries, and we're going to build an encrypted index. The way this encrypted index works is as follows. I take the entries in the column, and I'm going to encrypt them using the ORE encryption scheme, but instead of storing both the left and the right ciphertext, I'm going to throw away half of the ciphertext. I'm only going to store the right ciphertext in the encrypted index, and I'm going to store them in sorted order. That's going to be the index that we built. And the record IDs will be encrypted under some independent key using a standard symmetric, uh, semantically secure encryption scheme. And we do this for each uh, column over which we want to support range queries. So we want to support range queries over the name, the age, and the diagnosis uh, columns. We would have three different indices encrypted using three different ORE schemes. So let's look at our encrypted database. We contain the encrypted search indices, and then we're just going to simply encrypt each row of the database using another semantically secure encryption scheme. Let me now show you how we can handle range queries efficiently. Uh, ah, oh, before I do that, uh, well, we're going to work in a standard symmetric searchable encryption setting. So we assume that the client will hold the secret keys needed to perform queries and uh, decrypt the entries in a database. Okay. So how do we perform a range query? So suppose the client comes around, and a client wants to query for all records where age is between 40 and 45. What is the client going to do? The client possesses the ORE secret key. So in particular, the client can encrypt the values for the endpoints for the uh, query. So she's going to encrypt 40 and 45 here. But recall that because we're working in this left-right setting for ORE, uh, we don't actually need both components to perform comparisons. The client is actually going to throw away the right ciphertext and only run the left encryption algorithm. And now, uh, she sends those left ciphertexts to the server, and now the server has to perform the query. So the server is going to take the encrypted index, and basically, it's going to use binary search between using, uh, from the left ciphertext and the right ciphertext that allows the, the client, or I mean, sorry, the server to perform comparisons between the query and the entries in the database. So using binary search uh, and the comparison operation, the server can find all of the indices that fall into the requested range. The server now returns the encrypted indices that match the query, and everything that follows is fairly standard, right? Client decrypts these indices, obtains the matching records, and then client separately fetches the records from the database. Uh, so there is some online leakage. So we imagine what the server gets to see during this transaction. The server gets to see the access pattern. This is kind of standard in most uh, searchable symmetric encryption scenarios. Uh, but moreover, the server also gets to see whatever is leaked by our order revealing encryption scheme. So the server gets to see the comparison responses between the left ciphertext uh, or the query and every element in, a, uh, in the index. But this, the server does not get to see uh, or does not get to learn inform or additional ordering information about, other compo about the comparisons between uh, other elements within the index. Okay? But that's in the online setting, which is not quite the focus of this work. We're focused on how do we provide robustness against inference attacks? How do we achieve security in the offline setting? So let's see what happens if our adversary now breaks into the database and exfiltrates the database. Well, everything that we have shown here is actually encrypted under a semantically secure encryption scheme. So all of these columns, these are encrypted under a standard symmetric encryption scheme. Here, if we look at the indices, the encrypted record values, uh, or uh, record indices, these are also encrypted under a symmetric, uh, semantically secure scheme. And the, the ones, uh, the values themselves are encrypted under an order revealing encryption scheme where we only have the right ciphertext, which in particular provides semantic security. So everything here is semantically secure, and so in the offline setting, we actually get best possible security. Okay, so let's just revisit the landscape of ORE and see where, uh, what, uh, how far we have come. So based on the inference attacks that we have seen in the previous work and uh, in other concurrent work and as well as work from last year, we basically have seen that the sort of the conventional order revealing encryption schemes, sort of these classic schemes such as OPE and our scheme from earlier this year, they're completely broken by these inference attacks and are probably dangerous to use in practical scenarios. However, uh, on the bright side, 
the, some of the newer order of Yoli encryption schemes, so that's just the one that we, I will uh, describe uh, soon, as well as some of the uh, works that has been uh, concurrent, these schemes actually can be adapted to work inside this left and right framework and actually can provide perfect offline security uh, when we use them to build range queries in a very specific way. So this sort of shows that order revealing encryption can still be useful as a building block for encrypted database scenarios, but when we use them, we have to be much more careful in how we apply them in the, to the existing scenarios. Okay, so for the next part of this talk, I'm actually going to show you how we build our order revealing encryption scheme that provides uh, this kind of left-right decomposability where one size has semantic security, and the only primitive that we will require is PRFs. So everything depends only on block ciphers still. So our starting point is going to be a small domain order revealing encryption. I'm going to explain what I mean by small domain. Uh, but it provides best possible security. So ideal security, revealing only, the only information it reveals is the ordering and nothing more. And then once we have the small domain ORE, we're going to apply a domain extension technique that was inspired by some of our previous work. And this domain extension will allow us to, uh, to basically compile a small domain ORE into a large domain ORE. So an ORE that works on small plain text spaces to an ORE scheme that works on large plain text spaces. So this is a, just sort of a generic uh, framework for uh, constructing order revealing encryption schemes. So let's start with a much simpler goal of constructing order revealing encryption when we assume that the plain text space is tiny. So let's say the plain text space is the numbers one through n, and you can think about n as something like 256, like a one byte, two to the eight. What we're going to do is we're going to consider uh, for each element in a plain text space, so for each number between one and n, we're going to generate an uh, encryption key, a cryptographic key associated with it. And the secret key for the order revealing encryption scheme is simply going to be this uh, set of keys, one for each, uh, uh, one for each position. Uh, we can actually derive these from a PRF, so we, the secret key does not have to be huge for the ORE scheme, but this is not material. So for simplicity, let's just assume that the secret key consists of one key for each position. So how do we encrypt the value i? We're going to do it in a, basically in a brute force manner. We're going to construct a vector of length n, where the first i positions contain the value 1, and the last n minus i positions contain the value 0. So the invariant in this vector is that all positions less than or equal to i have the value 1, while all positions greater than i have the value 0. The intuition now is that, suppose I want to compare the number 2 to the value i. Well, what do I do? I can look up the second entry in this vector, and that actually encodes the comparison between 2 and i. So this is sort of uh, the intuition for how the scheme works. Uh, we're now going to, because we have n keys, why don't we now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to encrypt each slot in this vector using one of those keys. So the first slot will be encrypted under the first key, the second slot will be encrypted under the second key, and so on. To allow comparisons, we're going to give out the key for slot number i. Okay? So this is what our ciphertext is going to look like. We're going to give out a key for slot number i, and then we're going to have the encrypted outputs of all the possible comparisons in the domain. So now, given two ciphertexts, how do we perform the comparison? Well, we're going to take the, if we have the encryption of ciphertext for a value i and an encryption of a value j, well, to decrypt, all I have to do is take this element and decrypt the ith component of this vector, and that will tell me the, the comparison response between i and j. Similarly, I can do the, uh, to the reverse relation. If I want to compare j with i, I can take this key, decrypt the j's component during the comparison of responses. Okay, some of you might be complaining now that this completely reveals i. This, what I told you right now, cannot possibly be secure because it actually reveals the message. And uh, that's exactly the thing that we're trying to hide. So this doesn't work by itself, but the intuition says that we're almost there. The only thing that we need to add now is a random permutation. So instead of uh, just encrypting the slots once through n, uh, we're going to first apply a random permutation to the slots. And when we give out the key, it, we're also going to tell you which index to, uh, what is the permuted index to look at. Uh, the second thing to note about this scheme is that if we decompose it in, such a, in this way, where we call a key a left component, and this encrypted vector or encrypted permuted vector as the right ciphertext, because all of, these, uh, cipher all of these components are encrypted under independent keys using a symmetric encryption scheme, this is actually semantically secure and actually reveals no information about the underlying plain text values. Uh, moreover, we can actually prove, and I'll refer you to the paper for the details, that it, this achieves ideal security. So it, it achieves simulation security uh, in a model where uh, the simulator only gets to see the comparisons. So the leakage of this scheme is only the comparisons, only the order relations, and nothing more. The drawback is that ciphertexts are large. If my, cipher if my plain text space is 32 bits, the ciphertext is going to have 2 to the 32 elements in it. That's much too big to be of practical use. Uh, 
So the second step that we have is, OK, we can build ORE for very small domains, for like byte-sized elements. We can encrypt them in such a way to provide best possible security. How do we use this ORE scheme to build a larger ORE scheme for a larger plain text space? And the idea here is that we're going to first decompose the message into smaller blocks. So suppose I want to encrypt 8-bit messages. What I can do is I can first break them up into two 4-bit chunks. So uh, we're going to use 4-bit chunks here. So that will be the block size for this ORE scheme. And basically, each chunk will be encrypted using an ORE instance, a small domain ORE instance, with the secret key derived from the prefix of that block. Right? So I'm going to take these two blocks, encrypt them using an ORE scheme, where for the first block, this key is going to be based on, uh, derived based on the empty prefix. The second key is going to be derived from a prefix uh, based on the first uh, four bits of the value, or the first few blocks. So how does comparisons work now? So I take my uh, message, encrypt it, and now I have two messages, or uh, two ciphertexts. The way to compare is basically we go block by block, and we basically first compare the first blocks, and we check, are they equal? If they're equal, then we go on to the next block. If they're not equal, then we have learned the result of the comparison. And the reason that uh, this works is because the keys used is derived from the, pre is derived from the prefix. So first, uh, initially, uh, these two messages both share the same prefix, namely the empty prefix. So that's why comparisons will work. And if the comparison outputs zero, i.e., that these two uh, messages are equal in the first block, then that means that these two uh, cy ciphertext blocks are also encrypted using the same underlying ORE key. If not, then we learn the output of the comparison. And this is how the security argument works. So the overall leakage in this case is the first block that defers. Right? So the first block in the two messages, so the first four-bit chunk that defers between the two messages. Uh, this allows a similar decomposition into the left and right ciphertext. So if I have an aggregate ciphertext here, the left ciphertext can just be the left ciphertext of each of the corresponding blocks. Similarly for the right ciphertext, since the right ciphertext, each of the underlying right ciphertext provides semantic security, the overall right ciphertext also provides semantic security. Some optimizations are actually possible. We use a non-black box application of this technique. I'll refer you to the paper for the details there. Uh, but this is the high-level description of how we can go from small domain ORES to large domain ORES at the expense of some leakage. So let's come back to the picture again that I showed at the beginning of the talk. What does the landscape of ORE look like now? So previously, uh, sort of the best known result we had was an ORE scheme where the leakage is the first, uh, the position of the first differing bit. In our current scheme, we now can sh get leakage where it's the position of the first differing block, where now the block size is a parameter that you can vary depending on your particular application and performance trade-offs. Okay. So to conclude the talk, I'm going to try to argue that this new ORE scheme is still very practical and very efficient. Uh, so this scheme is still only requires PRFs. We just require symmetric encryption scheme. So everything can be based essentially on AES. And so we implemented both our scheme as well as the previous scheme uh, by Bodreva et al., this uh, order preserving encryption scheme. And it turns out that if we encrypt 32 bit values, our schemes are it's actually 65 times faster compared to existing order preserving encryption schemes, which is the thing that is used today. So they require about three milliseconds to encrypt. And we're going to encrypt a byte sized chunk. We only require 50 microseconds uh, per encryption. Comparison time is basically negligible, uh, under one microsecond to compare, as, as long as you're only encrypting byte sized chunks. Uh, the main limitation, though, is that the ciphertexts are much, now much longer. We have a 30x expansion factor. So to encrypt a single 32-bit value, the ciphertext is going to be 224 bytes. Uh, so this can be substantial in practice, but usually order revealing encryption will be applied to small fields. So hopefully this not, does not require uh, much larger databases in practice. But the thing that I would like to emphasize is that security is substantially better now. If we use one of these original schemes to build an encrypted database uh, uh, protocol, we're going to leak a lot of information in both the online and the offline settings. Here, at least, if we use our new protocols, we can actually achieve security against offline inference attacks uh, if, as long as we use uh, our building block in a, in a slightly novel way. So to conclude, uh, I've hopefully uh, demonstrated that inference attack, or as you have seen in the previous talk, inference attacks basically render many conventional property preserving based encryption constructions insecure for the problem of searching on encrypted data. However, hopefully I've demonstrated to you in this talk, order revealing encryption still remains a useful building block 
for uh, supporting searching on encrypted data. And so in this talk, I introduced a new paradigm for constructing order revealing encryption that allows us to build range query protocols on encrypted databases in a way that is mostly legacy compatible. It's not as legacy compatible as directly applying order revealing encryption uh, to the uh, uh, database values, but it's still mostly, it's, we're not requiring uh, very uh, significant changes to the underlying protocols. But uh, the significant gain that we have now is that we get offline semantic security. We get complete robustness at least in the offline setting against the inference attacks that we've seen so far. Uh, we have now also given a new order revealing encryption scheme based on very standard cryptographic primitives, namely PRFs, that is concretely efficient and provides stronger security than the existing constructions. And in a theoretical model, we can certainly have proofs that show that our uh, schemes uh, has less leakage. And in a paper, we also give some new impossibility results for the security achieved uh, using OPE. I guess this is becoming less and less relevant because OPE does not seem to be a useful building block, as useful of a building block in building encrypted database scenarios. So with that, I'll open the floor to questions. The code is available on GitHub. We have a website that has all of our constructions and so on. Thank you very much. Questions, please. I'm Serge Vaudonnet from EPFL. Do I understand well that in the system you're proposing doesn't, doesn't allow to make uh, multiple composite range queries involving several columns? Uh, oh, if you want to do range queries over multiple columns. So that is not directly supported by the current protocol. Basically, if you want to implement a conjunction or a disjunction, you would have to do a range query on each of the underlying columns and then uh, perform the separate Boolean formula yourself. And go back and forth between the client and the server. Uh, well, you can, you can do it in one round, in the sense that you can do all of the range queries. You can submit all of the endpoints in the one message and have the server return all of the encrypted indices in the second one and have the client sort of do the post-processing and filtering. And so if you can do it in one, uh, one uh, communication, it means that the attack of the previous paper applies. Uh, so, the so the server will learn some additional information based on uh, correlations in that case, yes. Sure, but that, will re that may reveal uh, correlated information, sort of, of which records is appearing in mo across multiple, uh, is falling into multiple ranges. Yeah. One more question. Hey, thanks for your great talk and really interesting work. Um, I wanted to ask, so you mentioned that you can get semantic security for the values that are stored in the database because you only <laughs> store the right half, yes. as you say. Um, so do you then reveal more about the range query endpoints themselves because you have to send the left. Right, part. so we have the online leakage of the system, which I didn't quite talk about, but the online leakage is basically whatever is revealed by the order revealing encryption scheme. So now, let's say you want to do a range query with two endpoints, then you have two left ciphertexts and you have the collection of right ciphertexts, and basically the leakage is the leakage between every left ciphertext and every right ciphertext. Okay, so, so, the, so the assumption is that the server does not store the previous query. That's right. The server should f needs to forget uh, each of the left ciphertext after processing the query. So let me ask also one question. Mm -hmm. uh, your motivation was that uh, you ha Yahoo said uh, they could not search your index. Mm -hmm. So I believe you that they can search, but can they index? Uh, sorry, what do you mean? If the, if the uh, encryption is in, uh, uh, randomized, uh, standard secure, can they index their database? Ah, so right, so that's a good question. Uh, so in our anticipated application, or the way that we would use this kind of construction, is that when you first create a database, you will build the index, and the client would have to be participate in that process. So we assume that the index has already been constructed on the server, and now given the index, we're, we're asking the question, how do we perform the search efficiently? Advertisement, if you wish, we visited the CCSW workshop uh, tomorrow, learn how to do that in the online phase too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for attending this session. Let's thank uh, David one more time.